Oh, that's the wrong mouse, sorry. All right, uh, welcome everyone to our uh, final day of our conference here. Um, I'm pleased to have as our plenary speaker this morning, uh, Dror uh, Barnazan, who will be speaking to us about cars, interchanges, traffic counters, and a pretty darned good not invariant. So let's all welcome our speaker. Uh, if you haven't, please make sure you get a handout and I will pass the baton off. Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to Waco. I uh, remind you there is a handout, so please make sure that you have a copy. Here's what it looks like in full glory. Uh, also, it's available on the web. So the acronym Omega Epsilon Beta throughout this talk stands for this URL, and uh, there are various links to it. Uh, and I suppose uh, let me start. So. Uh, the abstract said something about knots and things like that. So uh, let me remind you what are knots. So for the per or, or what are not invariants. So for the purpose of this talk, uh, a knot is a picture like this. Here are two examples, one by Oki, another by Thistlethwaite. And uh, these pictures are considered Modulo so-called Reidemeister moves. There are three of them, Reidemeister one, Reidemeister two, Reidemeister three. And with a little bit of three-dimensional imagination, you can see what they mean. And there is a theorem of Reidemeister that the thing you think of as not, so ropes in R3 uh, modulo motions where you're not allowed self-intersections. So that thing really is uh, these pictures modulo these mo moves. Uh, knots are hard. So in general, it's very hard to tell whether two pictures are the same modulo these, mo modulo these moves. In fact, these two pictures are the same modulo these moves, but it's very, 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 very hard to see. Okay, so uh, to separate knots and also to study them in other ways, we need so-called invariants. Invariants are simply functions defined on the diagrams, so defined on the pictures. You can read them off, compute them from the pictures, and that do not change, so that are invariant under these moves, and have values inside something easy, because this is hard, so you want values inside something easy, so it will be easy to tell things apart uh, or to, to Okay, and uh, so for example, uh, the integers or Laurent polynomials or matrices of Laurent polynomials or something where we know how to manage it. So I seek uh, strong, fast, and homomorphic knot entangle invariants. And uh, let me. Um, uh, try to explain what these things mean. So strong is kind of obvious. I want to, it to have a, a small kernel. I want it to be nearly one to one. Okay, so I want it to be as close as possible to separating uh, knots. Fast means, so you see, there are knots of interest that are pretty large. For example, this knot here, is a potential counterexample to the so-called ribbon slice conjecture. It was studied by Gomp, Sharman, and Thompson, and it has 48 crossings. This knot here was studied by Lisa Pissirillo and uh, has 55 crossings. So the negative two up here means uh, two full twists. So that's an additional bunch of crossings that you don't see. So two two times this three lane highways twist about itself uh, in the negative direction, whatever that means. Uh, so, so this knot has actually 55 crossings and sometimes you want to compute invariants of such knots. Now, if the computational complexity of your invariants is exponential, so say two to the number of crossings, then two to the 48 or two to the 55 is way beyond what you can do. So you want fast. 
in part, best is if you can find polynomial time uh, computable um, invariants. By the way, for, for reasons unknown to me, like, uh, you know, knot theory has been around for a long, long time, and people completely ignore this issue. Like, they, they, they write an invariant and pretend it's good without saying anything about how fast it, it computes. Not everybody, of course, but th there is this uh, uh, tendency. Uh, so I told you what strong and fast is. Now I need to tell you what is homomorphic. So I will be a bit loose about homomorphic, and I will be a bit loose about homomorphics throughout this talk, even though it's very, very important. So uh, homomorphic means it should extend to tangles. So tangles are like pieces of knots. God, should I take it? Take it so tell it? No, I should not tell the terrible joke. Never mind. I ignore me. So, um, uh, uh, so it's like half a knot. And in general, by the way, um, that's another thing that's underappreciated in knot theory. Uh, in general, um, it's um, like it, it, it's nicer to be able to talk about half things rather than the completed things because uh, then you have simpler presentations and you can say it's uh, defined by generators modulo relations uh, and knot theory is as a whole, knots are not somehow generators modulo relations, but, but tangles, half knots can be, pr have, pre fi have finite, finite presentations. Anyway, uh, so tangles have operations on them. So if you have two tangles, so two half knots, you can put them side by side, provided the ends match, and then you get a bigger tangle, okay? Uh, so uh, you want invariants that are defined on the halves and that have a formula for how to compose. Uh, so that's what homomorphic means. Actually, tangles also have extra operations. So for example, there is the operation which I marked here by D1, which says take strand number one and double it, okay? So a homomorphic invariant should also have good behavior. Good behavior means, well, under this move, under this operation, where good behavior means that if you know how to compute the invariant of the left-hand side, there is a determined formula how to compute the invariant of the right-hand side. Uh, now, why is this useful? So this is an aside. I mean, I really uh, want to talk about one specific invariant, so I'll, I'll say it relatively quickly. And if you want to hear more, you can go to omega epsilon beta slash AKT, a, a previous talk that I gave, which is sort of more devoted to this. But the point is that there are um, properties of knots uh, that are definable using these operations. For example, a knot is ribbon. So ribbon has another definition, topological geometric, and I'm not going to repeat it. I'll only, only tell you that there are open problems about ribbon knots and you want to be able to show that some specific knots are not ribbon. In fact, you'll be famous if you'll show that this knot is not ribbon, the, the, the uh, Gomp, uh, Sharman, Thompson. So anyway, uh, a knot is ribbon if and only if uh, there exists a tangle whose skeleton looks like this. So I'm not telling you, uh, uh, I'm not showing it, but these strands that appear here in the middle of, for, for the tangle T are all knotted with each other. And then you take that tangle and you double the vertical strands, and then you glue some other tangle on the top and some other tangle on the bottom, and you get, so now, uh, again, these bands and these uh, lines are all knotted with each other, okay? And a knot is ribbon if it is obtained by this procedure from a tangle T 
which has the property that if you delete all the vertical strands, uh, you're left with the untangle. You have, you're left with something which is completely unknotted. You don't have to follow it. You don't need to see why it's true. Um, the point to take is that a useful property is, define, is definable in terms of, the, of, of operations on tangles. So now if you, have a, if you had an invariant which was homomorphic relative to these operations, then this trans useful property on complicated things would get pushed, will be translated to a useful property stated in terms of simple things, matrices, Laurent polynomials, I don't know. And then potentially uh, you, would, you would have a handle on showing that some specific knot does not have this property. Okay, or potentially you will be able to say something about ribbon knots. And since I want to be able to say things about ribbon knots, and in fact, I want to be able to say it about relatively large knots, I want an invariant that will be strong, fast, and homomorphic. Okay, anyway, uh, having said all this, I'm going to describe one to you. Okay, so that's the content of my, of my talk, the pretty darn good uh, not invariant. But I'm going to describe it, you know, following a conversation I had with Von Jones uh, like 20 years ago. So we were walking in the Berkeley campus and I was telling him something philosophical. And he told me, can you turn it into formulas? And I said, who cares about formulas? It's, it's nice and it's so beautiful, the idea. Uh, and, and, and he said something like formulas stays, but interpretations or philosophies uh, change with time. And I think I came to believe him because nothing came out of the philosophy, but whatever you end up writing as a formula uh, has a better chance of staying. So I'll describe uh, the invariant completely as formulas, and then I'll tell you uh, a little bit about the philosophy uh, behind them. Okay, so uh, here it is. Here is a recipe how to compute an invariant. Uh, you know, I should be having the timer pointing at me so that I'll know what time it is. Okay, so uh, take an N crossing knot K and draw it as on the right. Uh, so uh, the properties the, 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 the properties here are, are that all crossings are facing up. So every crossing involves two strands and I was, want both of them to face up. And of course, not every knot is given that way a priori, but you can always take a crossing and rotate it so that it looks that way, okay? Uh, and uh, the edges are marked with a running index K, which you can check runs from one to two N plus one. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they're also marked with rotation numbers called phi k. And you see, uh, since the edges between crossings, so like this edge, edge number two, starts at one crossing and ends at another, since they always uh, point up at their beginnings and at their ends, uh, it makes sense to ask how many times do they rotate, okay? So basically you, the, you, you follow that, the, it's, it's the rotation number of a plane curve. You, you follow the tangent to the, uh, to the uh, edge and that tangent to the edge starts vertical and ends vertical, but in between may, may do a certain number of rotations uh, around S1 and you count that number and that's phi k. So in this diagram, phi k is equal to zero for most edges, but there is one edge, this one that starts here and go all the way and goes from up here and down to the bottom. So edge number four and its rotation number phi four is negative one, okay? And then you make a, an in a 2n plus one by 2n plus one matrix as follows. So you start from uh, the identity matrix I, and then for each crossing, 
you add a two by two block that looks as follows. So each crossing is labeled with a running index I and a running index J. So I is always the label of the upper strand and J is always the label of the lower strand. And then up above, you'll have I plus one and J plus one because the indices run. And uh, there are two types of crossings, the so-called positive crossing and the negative crossing and S is their sign. The crossing is labeled C. Uh, I will not uh, tell you uh, how to determine the sign of a crossing, but it's a standard uh, thing. And then given such a crossing, you add a block as follows to the matrix A. Namely in row I and row J and column I plus one and column J plus one, you place the two by two matrix, negative T to the power S, S is the sign of the crossing, T to the power S minus one, zero minus one. Okay? And then you let G be the inverse of that matrix A. So let's do an example. So for the note shown here, I will be getting a seven by seven matrix as follows. If you stare at this matrix, you see that on the diagonal, I have the identity because I started from the identity. And then say, look at the top crossing. It's a crossing where it's a positive crossing where strand three goes over strand six. So in row three and row six and columns four and column seven, I should have a copy of this matrix. And indeed it's highlighted in yellow here. So in row three and row six and column four and column seven, I have negative T, T, T minus one, zero minus one. That's how the matrix was constructed, nothing exciting, okay? And then uh, G is the inverse of that matrix and that's even less exciting. Here it is, that's what it came out. My computer told me that I didn't do it by hand, okay? In fact, even the typesetting is by the computer, okay? Uh, uh, you know, speaking of how unexciting it is, uh, let me tell you that the matrix here, you may recognize it. People who do not theory or braid theory may recognize it. This is the Burao, essentially the Burao matrix coming from the Burao representation. This matrix here, A, is the presentation matrix for the Alexander module of the knot. Uh, when it is computing by applying Fox calculus to the Wirtinger presentation of the fundamental complement of the knot. And even inverting A is not a new idea because it's essentially what happens when you compute the Blanchfield pairing uh, of, of uh, related to the knot, associated with this knot. And if you look carefully, you'll see that all of these pictures are black and white, which tells you that they're old, okay? So, uh, and in fact, uh, the Alexander polynomial, one of the most classical and most useful knot invariants, in fact, by far the best knot invariant, it is reasonably strong, though a lot weaker than what I'm going to tell you about now. Uh, it is definitely fast, and it is homomorphic, though very few people actually know that it's homomorphic. Uh, but uh, so, and in fact, it, it says a lot about the knot. It, 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 it's the thing to imitate, okay? Uh, but, uh, but it's very old. Uh, so, uh, uh, it's, and what it is, is it's just the determinant of the matrix A renormalized by some power of the variable t. And the power is t to the minus phi, phi minus, o minus w divided by two, where phi is the total rotation number and w is the sum of the signs of all the crossings over, of, of the knot. And now if you're a classical topologist, is there a classical topologist in the room? There has to be. So, I mean, uh, if you're a classical topologist, you should like, oh no, this is so boring. Okay, and in fact, it's boring. Well, I mean, it was known when pictures were black and white. Um, now let's continue with the formula. So this box is everything. This is where all the new stuff happens. So um, uh, for a crossing C, 
with sign S and two incoming strands, the upper one I and the lower one J, I define a quant quantity R1 of C, and R1 of C is the sign S times a certain quadratic expression, GJI multiplied by GJ plus one J, whatever is written here. Uh, it's a quadratic explain expression in the entries of the matrix uppercase G that was written here, okay? Uh, and, uh, and then I define row one, and row one is my invariant, the invariant I'm going to talk about. Uh, and, it's just this, and it's just the sum of the R1 terms. So it's a sum of a one contribution per crossing, and this contribution is quadratic in the, in the, in the matrix elements of G, uh, minus something which is linear in the matrix uh, elements of G, and it's a correction term. So it's a sum over the edges. For each edge, you take its rotation number and multiply by GKK minus a half. And then you multi and then since it's quadratic in the inverse of a matrix, it will have denominators. So you clear the denominators by multiplying by the determinant squared, namely by the Alexander polynomial squared. Now, uh, uh, um, and then in our specific example, it's just brainless computation. Row one comes out to be comes out to be this uh, uh, polynomial. Okay, I claim that row one is uh, a not invariant and I will show it later. I will also show you that it's strong, fast, and I'll discuss why it's homomorphic without showing. Uh, and if you are a classical topologist, then at this point you should be saying, what the heck is going on? Because it's something you don't do, okay? A classical topologist would never uh, look at such a thing, multiply entries of this uh, inverse. It's just not done. It's very close to things that are done. It's so close that it fits in two lines, okay? Like after, you've, after the black and white photos, the things that are really, really boring, it all fits in just two lines, but it's never, never, ever done. Okay. Uh, good. Um, you know, maybe I've taken the Jones uh, uh, advice even more seriously than he intended. So uh, not only everything has to have a formula. In fact, formulas should be should be implemented. If they're don't if they're not implemented, I don't believe them. Okay. So here is an implementation. So uh, first of all. Uh, let's, uh, preliminary, so I'm loading a standard package of knot theory, which really has nothing relevant. It just has a, a long collection, a large collection of notes, knots in its database, okay? And I load an, a second package, which is again irrelevant. You see most knot, knot presentations um, uh, do not contain the rotation number. So I, I load a little minor package called rot.m, which computes rotation numbers for all the edges. Okay. I, again, this is no, this is not really related to, to the content of this talk. So I'm allowing myself not to show the packages, the content of the packages, just believe me that they exist. Uh, and then here is the program. That's all. That's the complete implementation of the invariant I just described. So first of all, R1 of a sign and index I and S index J is given by this formula. And you've seen this formula before. It's the same formula. Then rho of a note K is a module with some local variables. The first thing you do is you call rot K and rot K returns a list of crossings and a list of rotation numbers. Then you let A be the identity matrix. And for each crossing, which looks like an S, I, and a J, you add to the matrix A, A in rows I, J, and columns I plus one, J plus one, 
this matrix, the Burao matrix, again, you've seen it before. Then you let delta be the determinant of A renormalized by some nonsense. Then you let G be the inverse of A. Then you let row one be the sum over all the crossings of R1 applied to that crossing minus the correction term. And then you output the Alexander polynomial delta. You see the Alexander polynomial is a part of the computation. So I actually consider it as a part of row, row one, okay? Uh, so you output the Alexander polynomial and delta squared times the thing that I call row one, where every place you see G alpha beta, you, you replace it by the matrix entry of G in position alpha beta. That's the whole program, that's it. It's as simple as something can be. Uh, so here are the first few nodes. I compute uh, the invariant for all nodes with uh, up to six crossings. I, I have nothing to say, that's the output. Okay, I'm just showing that the program works. Uh, now, just to show you that it's fast. So here is this gomf sharman thompson knot, and here the edges are labeled. I've labeled the edges from one to God knows what it comes out to be. Um, and I've entered it using some notation. So positive crossing where 14 goes over one, the negative crossing where, where edge two goes over edge number 29 and so on. And then I've, I've let the computer print row of that, in, of that note and also tell me the timing. It took 86 seconds. 86 seconds for a 48 crossing note is not bad, okay? I can go faster, but not, 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 not right now. Anyway, uh, and the next thing, so, so it satisfies the fast property. And now I want to tell you that it's strong. So I have the computer print the number of nodes with up to 12 crossings. This is data that's available to the package that I loaded at the beginning, okay? And then I uh, basically uh, make a table of the values of row uh, and check how many distinct elements there are in it. And then I make a table of the value of the home fly and Hovanov homology taken together uh, for nodes without 12 crossings. And the computer prints out these numbers, which means that there are 2,977 prime nodes with up to 12 crossings. And the pair, Alexander polynomial and row one, which again, I consider them as one, uh, att attains 2,882 distinct values on that, which means that it misses the deficit is 95, whereas Hovanov homology and the Homfley polynomial taken together only have a deficit of 192. So it's a reasonably strong invariant. Um, and before telling you about homomorphic, now it's time to prove that it's an invariant and also to tell you some stories about cars and interchanges, okay? So this is the interpretation bit. This is the part that will be forgotten. Okay, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, traffic on interchanges. So cars always move forward along a knot, right? A knot is an oriented piece of strand. So when cars drive along a knot, they always move forward. And occasionally they go through interchanges, right? When one strand goes over another. And the rule is that if they go in the lower lane, they just continue. Okay, but if they are on the upper lane, they continue with a high probability T. If the crossing is positive, this probability is T, and it's a probability which is near one. And, but they also can fall from the upper lane to the lower lane with probability one minus T. Okay. Now, I don't really mean probabilities. I mean, I don't really mean T is between zero and one. These are algebraic probabilities. So I use the rules of probabilities to manipulate them, but I will ignore uh, uh, the rule, the basic rule of probability, which is that probabilities run between zero and one. So if the negative, if the crossing is negative, uh, uh, then you pass through with probability t to the minus one, uh, which is again close to one. And, uh, and again, I mean close to one in some algebraic sense, something is invertible, but I will not go through what it really means, okay? Anyway, 
Uh, so just let's view it and then play with it and understand what's going on. So if a car starts at on the on the lower lane, let's do the second picture first. So if a car starts at the lower lane of this interchange, it comes out, out here with probability one. And I've put here a traffic counter. A traffic counter is these like uh, pieces of uh, uh, um, rope, not rope, uh, wire that uh, uh, authorities put on the road to count how much traffic goes through. So if the traffic counter is placed here, it counts one. And if it's placed here, it counts zero, okay? Uh, however, if I start on the upper uh, strand and I place a traffic counter here, the, uh, it, it will measure one minus T. And if, uh, and if I put the traffic counter on the right, it will measure T, okay? Or if, if I run a stream of cars from here, T percent of it will go here and one minus T percent of here of it will be measured by this counter, okay? And likewise for negative crossings, except T gets replaced by T inverse. Is it clear what the rules of traffic are? Good. Uh, let's do a, okay, sorry. So theorem, the entries of the matrix G, which are the key to everything, which is the key to everything. So G alpha beta is the reading of a counter traffic, of, of a traffic counter placed in position beta on edge beta, assuming you inject cars uh, at, uh, on edge alpha. And by convention, I could have used the other convention, but just by convention, if alpha is equal to beta, then I place the counter after the car, okay? So here is an example. Consider this tiny tangle here, which is just a kink, okay? So if I inject a car here on the far left on strand number one, and if I measure how much traffic goes through this counter, the first counter, then the amount of, of traffic is one, right? The full stream of traffic goes through here, okay? Uh, now, if the traffic counter is on the kink itself, then let's, let's measure how much traffic it will see. So basically, the cars go under undisturbed, so I count one. But then they go again through the same crossing and with probability one minus T, they fall down. And then they count, they get counted again. So I get one plus one minus T. But then I pass through this, the, the one minus T fraction of the cars passes through the crossing once again and may fall once again. And then I get one minus T squared. So overall this counter here counts sum over p, one minus t to the p. p is the number of times you cycled around. And this is a sum of a geometric series. It comes out to be t inverse. And then, um, and then uh, at the end, all of the cars have to come out because uh, basically the probability of falling is small. So overall, at the end, all of the cars get pushed out and, 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 and come out. So the last counter measures one. Now, had I injected the, the car here instead of uh, on the left, so had I injected it on the uh, uh, um, kink, then uh, you see that's in fact exactly the same as injecting it before the kink because traffic goes under the underpass unchanged. So I get T inverse here and one here. The only thing that changes is that the counter that is before the king counts nothing. So that's the zero here. And finally, if I inject the, the car on the last strand, then nothing will ever go through the kink, nothing will ever go backwards. So the only counter that measures anything is the counter here. So the overall matrix is, well, the first row is from the first car. So one T inverse one, one T inverse one and so on. Okay. Uh, okay, 
Now um, you see, so I made an assertion. I mean, this was an example, but the assertion was a G alpha beta is the reading of a traffic counter. Well, this assertion, okay? So let's prove it. Proof, so uh, um, near a crossing C with sign S and uh, incoming uh, strands I and J, um, both sides, so G alpha beta as an inverse of a matrix and G alpha beta as a traffic counting exercise satisfy these relations. So when you look at the inverse of a matrix, so the inverse of a matrix is defined by the property that A times G is equal to the identity, uh, but this just means that the rows of A or maybe the columns of, of G, sorry, the, God, now I'm, I've lost my orientation. Basically, this means that the entries of G satisfy some relations. And A was a super simple matrix defined from, uh, you know, a little bit of action per crossing. So basically this means that you'll have uh, relations between the entries of G uh, uh, one relate or two relations per crossing. And these are the relations. So, so G I beta is equal to Delta I beta plus whatever. Delta is the Kronecker Delta function. It comes from the identity matrix. And G J beta is equal to, well, this is just the, uh, what you learn from multiplying by the matrix A on the left. But you see, these are also traffic relations. So you see, the relation here says that if you go on the incoming strand, so if you come, sorry, on the lower strand, so if you enter at, on strand J, then the reading, uh, then, then, you, then that doesn't ch change the traffic relative to if you had entered on, on strand J plus one, unless the traffic counter beta was placed on strand J, in which case you have a def difference of one because one unit of traffic doesn't get counted because instead of starting at the bottom, it starts here and, and the counter is placed in between the two places. And likewise, the relation on the left can be interpreted as so ignore the Kronecker delta function. Basically, if a car enters at I, so if a car enters at I, it exits with probability T to the S at I plus one or with probability one minus T to, to do the S at J plus one. That's exactly the traffic rules that I wrote before. Okay, so I've proven this interpretation. I get a bonus. And the bonus, bonus is that near C, near every crossing, there are also relations that involve moving the traffic counters, like duly. Instead of moving the, the, the injection point of cars, I move the traffic counters. What, where, where, where are these relations coming from? Well, either because uh, this fact is equivalent to the fact that uh, G times A is equal to the identity, or you think a little bit about what counters do, and it's kind of clear that if you know how to count uh, the traffic at the output, you also know what the traffic at the input was, okay? So, so these are uh, these extra relations. And now let me uh, prove the invariance of row one, okay? So first of all, uh, let's look, so let's do it in the hardest case. Let's do invariance under Reidemeister move number three. So uh, here is Reidemeister move number three written here with some traffic indicated. So uh, suppose you inject the car on the bottom left, that's the black car here. Well, it will get to here with probability T and then to here with probability one minus T. And then from here, it will continue with probability T times T, so T squared, and, and, and it will fall off to here with probability T times one minus T. So the traffic counter, counters at the top will read this. 
uh, on the right, it's a slightly more complicated computation, but it comes out to be the same. So the more complicated output written here is in fact equal to that by, 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 by basic arithmetic. And the more, and, and like for the green cars, it's even easier. Like for the car at the right most, well, it just passes through both on the left and on the right. So, so, so it's even easier. So the moral is that overall traffic patterns, the traffic patterns outside of the domain shown here are not affected by doing a Rydermeister move. Like if a car in, come, comes in from here, it, it comes out with a certain collection of probabilities out here. And it doesn't matter whether you, on both sides. So it doesn't matter whether you've uh, uh, done the move or not. Uh, but this really means that uh, G alpha beta, the entries of the matrix G, right, which measures traffic, uh, is unchanged by doing Rydermeister 3, provided uh, the car injection site alpha and the traffic counters beta are away from the move. So therefore, the only contribution for row one, so how was row one computed? It was a sum of quadratics in G, one pair crossing. If the crossings are not the three crossings that participate in the Rydermeister move, then uh, nothing is changed. So the only issue is whether the sum of the three contributions, the three R1 contributions uh, coming from the three crossings within the Rydermeister move, whether they are, these three contributions add up to the same on the left or on the right. I'm a lazy bum, I never compute anything by hand, I did it by computer. So I uh, labeled this, the, the edges of the Rydermeister move completely arbitrarily, 10, 11, 12, 20, 21, 22, 30, 31, 32. And likewise on the right-hand side, uh, the G rules, the rules how G transforms near a crossing are written here. The left-hand side is the first Rydermeister, the, the first R1, so R1 of 20, 30, plus R1 of uh, 10 and 31, and so on. So this is the sum of the three R1s, and I apply to it the G rules. The G rules basically pushes, so you know, our, the terms that appear here are quadratics in the Gs, but there are quadratics in the entries of G where alpha and beta are near the crossing, but I have the rules and the rules allow me to push alpha and beta outside of the part that changes. So I push, I use the G rules to push them, um, to, to push the G alpha beta to where uh, traffic is unchanged. And I do it to the left-hand side, I do it to the right-hand side, and I get the same answers, and that's it. That's the end of the proof. Uh, similarly, um, uh, you can compute Rydermeister 1. So basically, you take the same little piece that I did before, the kink, and, uh, you, uh, and this kink is given by an explicit, the G alpha beta for this kink is given by this specific matrix. So I compute R1 of that kink and subtract the correction term and apply the rule that G alpha beta goes to the alpha beta entry of this matrix and tell the computer to compute this and the computer outputs this. And I, you know, I have to show you that I can do something by hand. So I computed by hand that this is equal to zero. Okay. So invariance under the other uh, moves are, is similar. So wearing my topology hat, uh, the formula for R1 and the, even the idea to look for such a formula uh, remains a complete mystery. I have no idea why to do that. I hope somebody here, maybe somebody will have an idea. I, I, I have no explanation for it as a topologist. It works. Wearing my quantum algebra hat, uh, I spy a Heisenberg algebra. 
uh, where do I spy a Heisenberg algebra? So basically, uh, traffic counters in cars are like the PNX of like position and momentum of quantum mechanics. They, uh, they, they, uh, the commutator is equal to one, right? Because uh, 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 if you inject traffic, so if you have a, 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 a line and you inject traffic uh, here and measure it here, or uh, in, inject the traffic uh, here and measure it before, you have a difference of one in the measurement, exactly one. So, so like uh, cars and traffic counters are a bit like PNX of uh, the Heisenberg algebra. And then you can push it. So uh, I, I think I'm running out of time, so I will not go through it, but basically, uh, you can interpret the crossing itself as some exponential inside the, the Heisenberg algebra. Um, and, and basically, uh, uh, the, the, the Bureau rules for, for traffic uh, are recovered from that. So they are how uh, P and X commute with exponentials. And that comes as near what happens in quantum algebra, but not quite because quantum algebra prefers Lie algebras and prefers exponentials in which the, um, um, the thing being exponenti exponentiated is in the Lie algebra tensor itself. And the Heisenberg algebra is not a Lie algebra because um, the commutator of X and P is one, and one is not is a scalar, it's not an algebra element. And also the thing being exponentiated here is not linear cross tensor linear, it's quadratic, it's more complicated. Uh, but then you can massage it, and now I'm running out of time, so I will, I, I, I will not tell you more about it, but you can massage it and uh, replace the Heisenberg algebra by a Lie algebra by renaming the various, by, by giving names to various things. Uh, and then that Lie algebra is a famous one. It's the so-called Diamond Lie algebra, which in itself is a reduction of SL2. And uh, SL2 can be quantized and uh, and, and, and therefore it has a universal quantum invariant, which in fact computes the, the color Jones polynomial. Uh, but you see, now you can go backward and uh, uh, all of this sequence of uh, abstractions can be, can be done backwards and you get a, a, a description of, of of that uh, general invariant in terms of the Heisenberg algebra, and then back in terms of traffic uh, on, on a knot diagram. Uh, and, uh, and also from this perspective, so quantum algebra, uh, well, has further properties which tell us that uh, rho one is homomorphic, uh, though I have not yet worked out how to express it in the simple-minded language of cars and traffic and traffic counters. Uh, also, quantum algebra uh, is, is much stronger. So there isn't just SL2, there are lots of semi-simply algebras and well, some parameter enters and you, you can look at higher uh, powers of that parameter. So row one is not alone there is a lot more like it. Uh, so, uh, but all of this description in terms of quantum algebra should read like insanity to you. Because why on earth something so simple as I described 
should have a, an explanation so complicated. And, and I think uh, it's only because, um, well, we're stupid. We went through history in the wrong order. Uh, and sooner or later, uh, so homework, find a good explanation for row ones. Find an explanation, you know, the thing, row one was defined by a, a tiny box on, your ha on the handout that you're holding. There should be an explanation the same size that any um, uh, topologist should be able to accept. Uh, so find a topology home for it and uh, make explicit the homomorphic properties and then finally use them to do topology. And I think I'll stop here. All right, well, uh, thank you for that. Uh, we have a, a moment for a few questions, if there are any. <clears throat> so, sorry. So, uh, yeah, good. Uh, so, uh, uh, somewhere in this quantum algebra description that I went through very fast, uh, uh, enters a parameter epsilon. And when epsilon is equal to zero, uh, you get um, uh, the Alexander polynomial, more or less. And then when you, when, when you look at, and then you expand in powers of epsilon, and the coefficient of epsilon to the one is rho one, and it's already a wonderful thing. And then uh, the coefficient of epsilon squared, you could call it rho two. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, somewhere in the references here, so some of these talks that I've given in our own video, and you can watch them, describe how to compute higher powers. So I, basically, I can compute higher powers as well. But anyway, there is a row two as well. And uh, in a word, uh, so, uh, uh, so if you have a complicated knot, row one is computed by, you set up a matrix, you invert it. In, inverting a matrix, by the way, is a polynomial time computation. And then it's even linear time after that essentially linear time or linear in the ring operations, because you just do a sum one contribution per crossing. Row two will be a quadratic time in the same sense. So you will be, sum over, you will be summing over pairs of, of pairs of crossings of a contribution for each pair. And then row three will be a sum over triples of crossings of a contribution for each triple. So all of them are still polynomial, but they're less and less polynomial. All right, any uh, further questions? Um, okay, so you were uh, comparing uh, row one to the Alexander polynomial earlier. Uh, do you know of like a, a simple example of a knot that is distinguished uh, or to know two knots that are distinguished by uh, row one, but not by the Alexander polynomial? Um, the answer is yes and no. Uh, do I know? Definitely not. I, it's not the kind of things, I, I don't remember such things. I, I, my memory just doesn't contain such things. Uh, does my computer know? Definitely yes. Namely, I've found examples. I, I you know, I, 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 I can find one in 20 seconds if I'm next to my computer, because again, this is fast to compute. So, I mean, yes, I, so depending in which sense I, I am to interpret your question. Okay. Um, yeah, I also have experimental evidence to show that row one has so, you know, the Alexander polynomial detects things like, or can tell things about the genus of the knot. And so does row one. And I have examples where row, row one tells you more refined information than the Alexander polynomial. Okay, but I have them in the sense that they're on some computer file somewhere, not in the sense that they're in my memory. All right. Uh... Uh, let's uh, thank our speaker again.
And uh, we'll take a break. Uh, Semi-plenary talks start at 9.25. And uh, I'd like to uh, point out that we did have a schedule change. Uh, James Farr will be our uh, morning uh, semi-plenary speaker in this room, uh, who has switched with uh, Hector Bariga Acosta, who will be speaking this afternoon. 